it says sometimes there's a prophet without honor in your own home, but we're one that loves to honor and especially to give honor to whom honor is due. Bishop Hammond uh, is known and renowned really around the world as uh, the father of the modern day prophetic movement. He's written books, he's preached, he's declared, he's prophesied over uh, kings, uh, over uh, presidents, have been with him, <clears throat> I think about three or four times in different White Houses around the world, ministering the word of the Lord to those in prominent positions as well as to hundreds and literally thousands upon thousands around the world from every strata and every part of life. And more than that, taking of that anointing and believing for a release of activation like Moses did with the 70s, saying there's something that will come through me of the spirit of the Lord and my spirit upon others that will rise up and they will prophesy and will not cease. And so with that testimony has been true and has rung true around the nations of the world. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to about 10 or 12 nations last year. Every nation I went to, they Oh, I know your dad. He's really mentored me. I said, well, do you know him personally? He said, no, but I've read his books, and I've been to some conferences, and I've heard some things on the web and just different ways. Some people know him personally. A lot of people have just received of that overflowing anointing that is upon his life. But we're really privileged to have him uh, right here in person to release the things that God's laid upon his heart. And he has really been a champion and one that has taken up the cause of let's see uh, that revival release, that reformation release. Let's see that new wave that that God wants to bring in that birthing of the revival of the Spirit of the Lord in America and in the nations of the earth. Uh, let's receive the apostolic and the prophetic and see the church arise in its power. And so uh, we are privileged and honored to receive a man of God. And so if you would with me, would you stand and let's just give a big hand of appreciation and love to Bishop Bill Hammond as he comes to minister the word of the Lord. I'm going to help him with the mic here. <laughs> and they were trying to fix Jane's like that one time at a place, she said, and, and uh, they couldn't get it working right. And she said, at home, my husband always turns me on. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. <laughs> well, I know next year is going to be great for several reasons, but two of them are. It's our 50th anniversary, Christian National. 50 years, and 50 is a year of Jubilee, amen? That means everything's coming back, everything's going to be paid for, everything's going forward. Also, it's the 500th year of restoration of the church. On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 arguments against the dead works of the Catholic Church and declared Christians could only be a Christian by the blood of Jesus and by faith and not by the dead works of the church. Amen. That was October 31st, 1517. and 2017, it's 500 years. And we're looking forward to it. I'm going to be with Cindy Jacobs over in Germany where, those, where they nailed the 95 Thesis on the church. We'll be having special services there. We'll probably be doing things special here because... We're the, we're the ministry that propagates restoration more than any other one in the world. I've been around the world everywhere. Any of the ministers that travel can tell you. The book on the eternal church covers restoration. I've looked and watched in libraries. I went to Oral Roberts Library. I've been to other libraries and talked to different pastors. And nobody else has written a complete book on the restoration of the church. And very few teach it and preach it. But how many believe God is, has restored the church for the last 500 years? Amen? And um, so we're believing God for great things here. 1988, I started giving the word of the Lord. Uh, that was the birthing year of the birthing of the prophetic movement. And I, I did it personally by myself for several years. In the early 90s, I encouraged some of our preachers to start believing God for a word too. And then in 1999, Cindy Jacobs and and Chuck Pierce and uh, uh, Peter Wagner and I started the Roundtable of International Prophets, and we've been going ever since. And we did it mainly because there was so much talk about Y2K. Does anybody remember Y2K? The big fear and all the anxiety, what's going to happen in the year 2000? The world going to come to an end? Is everything going to shut down? You know. So we got all the prophets together to find out what was going to happen. And the word we got us, there were several prophets there, major, other major prophets I could tell you about. But our consensus was that nothing major was going to happen. It would, it would be maybe a few little, you know, happenings here and there, but no world war calamity, no shutdown of things. 
but we need to worry about more about, I believe Paul Cain said worry more about 2005 than 2000. But anyhow, they talked about that. But we started that because we wanted a consensus from the prophets. When you're talking about a major situation, you need more than one prophet. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. So I, I was just talking to Cindy this afternoon, and uh, she sent me the um, word of the Lord that we all gave. And uh, we met in November this year, and it's several pages and talks a lot about what God's doing and saying. And I was glad to see it looked a lot like what I'm sensing and felt like this week that I put out. And um, we, it, it, we'll probably make that available also to some of you. But it talks about what God's going to do in different nations and different situations and many things. Well, I, I really sought the Lord what he wanted me to share. You know, we, we don't share with each other before we get the word um, uh, Gail or Bill Lackey or uh, this lady here, Jane Hammond. <laughs> you know, I forgot my wife's name one time. That's the lady I married right over there. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but it's amazing how the, and then when we come together at the round table of prophets, it's amazing how the unity and the flow, we say it different ways, but we all say about the same thing and sense the same thing. You'll be very interested in the revelation that uh, Gail got on the millennials. It's going to be very good. You'll, you'll be blessed with that. And there's so many good things that God's doing. And um, my, my, the three words I got, and I'm going to go through it, and then we're going to go, to, it's an open door, and I didn't get time to put it overhead, so you'll have to use it in your head. Uh, how many's got a Bible? I'm going to be re reading the Bible quite a bit. If you've got a Bible on your with you, you'll, you'll need it in a moment. But the, the word is open door, opportunity, advancement with God's World War III weapons. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about open door. And um, I really started giving the word of the Lord mainly in the beginning just for our, our ministers and how it related to CI. Then we began to expand it a little more. But this word here, you know, when you say you've got this before you, there's real conditions to it. It's really not to the, it, it's, it's open, it's like salvation. How many know it's whosoever will can come? But it's only those that believe and that receive and participate. So this word is really, I'll just kind of read what I've said. Uh, open door, God says, I give you an open door that no man can shut. It's directed mainly to those who have ears to hear what Christ is saying to his church who are walking in all present restored truth and have volunteered to be a warrior in God's newly activated, offensive, and powerful army called God's World War III. Psalm 110.3 says, Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. The NIV says it this way, Your troops will be willing in your day of battle. How many think you qualify for getting this word? All oh, six of you. Okay. How many feel you want to receive this word? All right. All right. <clears throat> right now, I put God is searching for soldiers of the cross who are willing to volunteer. He said his volunteers. How many want to volunteer for God's purpose? Don't have to wait to be drafted. And then he's also looking for those whose hearts are right that it can be productive. The, especially Matthew 13, 23, it talks about four kind of hearts. Soil, heart soil. It's those that says the seed falls by heart soil that's just where people walk all the time, and it's, pa it's packed down dirt. And the, and the birds come and pick the seed away before it even gets you anywhere. In other words, you lose the word before you get out the front door. Second talks about, second seed soil is falls in shallow ground, and it sprouts up quickly and with joy. It's so happy. It, it, all week it's happy. It got saved. A little trouble comes along, and temptation comes back, and they wither, and they're gone. Then the third soil is Pretty good plowed soil has been worked, it's been de-weeded, it's been cultivated, it's been fertilized. It's pretty good soil, but it's full of weed seeds. And the weed seeds have been there, and the, and the corn grows up or whatever's there, and that they grow up and chokes it out, and it never becomes fruitful. But then there's a fourth level that says it's been de-weeded, all weed seed attitudes, and it's been cleansed. I'm raised on a farm. I understand what that means. We had to pick up... Um, all kind of rocks and, and things out of our field uh, to get it ready for harvest. And we had to go and pull up the Johnson grass and all that. And, but it's been cleared, and then it's, it's good soil, and it's got rid of all of its hindrances, all of its restrictions, all of its things. And it produces some 30, some 60, some 100. 100%, 100 fold. 
How many like to be one that hundredfold? So I'm hoping this is hundredfold soil here tonight. Hallelujah. And that you've uh, really ready to receive that word. Now, 2 Chronicles 269 says, The eyes of the Lord, we can say God's Holy Ghost scanner, scanning over the earth, continue seeking for those whose hearts are loyal and pure and dedicated to God, so that he may show himself strong in their behalf. How many like God show himself strong on your behalf? Well, according to 2 Chronicles 16.9, he's more anxious to do it than you are. Come on. All you got to have is a loyal, open, pure, level four soil. And God's going to say, there's me one right there. And then Revelation, then you got to come to level number three in the overcomer. Revelation 12.11 said, they overcame. By the blood of the Lamb. How many's overcome by the blood of the Lamb? Word of their testimony. How many's done that? Now we're at level three. Love not their lives under the death. In, in this third reformation, you, 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 it costs you nothing but everything. You have, to, you have to die to self completely. That Christ may live in you holy. Now, um, God's only raising up mighty warriors with anointing, he's going to anoint you with his mighty warrior spirit and to demonstrate God's kingdom throughout the earth. Now, when we, I've got some teaching to do before we get there, but when we go to warfare tonight, I want you to believe God to do something great. My little granddaughter was over sharing with me this afternoon, and come up here, uh, Trey. Come on up here. And, and um, she, I've been gone. She's been wanting to share with me a lot of spiritual things that's happening. We're coming over here, and then I'll, I'll talk for you. You don't have to talk. But she's a talker. She can talk. She's my daughter. She's my grand, great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. Ten years old. Ten years old. Okay. <clears throat> I'm wearing lipstick already on my. But anyway. <laughs> I'm telling my great grandpa. <laughs> but she was sharing with me last year when we did the warfare at the end of the year. Uh, God gave her a spiritual experience. God let her feel the fires of hell. And she is burning, aching, and she didn't know what to do and started crying. She ran back to the bathroom, trying to get away from it and see if we get anything, came back, and we fought it, and it seemed like demons were fighting at her. And, and the year before, 2015, she had a lot of depression and discouragement and, and had seen visions of demons and stuff. And uh, she fought through all the end of the battle, and she says, we fought through the battle, and midnight struck, it all went away. And she's got joy and peace and heaven. She felt like it became a new girl. She said, I feel clear, clean. I felt like a new person. Amen. Hallelujah. Where she's having dreams and visions and heavenly experiences now all this year. It's been great. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless you. Okay. I want, how many want to receive that too? Amen. I'm going to work with them. <laughs> Don't get my anointing <laughs> for that. <laughs> I'm going to. This year, I'm going to work with these group and get them all prophesying and moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Um, I don't know who has that group, but we're going to get together and help them out there. Amen. Now, open your Bible to Revelation. In chapter 1 and 2 and 3, especially 2 and 3, Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches to John, and he writes these seven churches to the Seven letters to the churches. How many believe Jesus meant what he said and said what he meant when he wrote to those churches? Did he mean he would do what he said he'd do and they had the problem that he said they had? Now, how many's ever read chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation in your lifetime? Okay. You remember every, everyone has a salutation and then he has an you know, introduction to him, a commendation. And then he usually has a condemnation. He goes, I know your works. And you're faithful here, and you're doing this, and you're doing that. And that's great, but I have this against you. You're doing this, you're doing that, and you need to adjust. And in a Laodicea church, he says, you either straighten up, or I'm coming and taking your whole church away from you. I'm removing your candlestick. And, uh, and the other place, he says, you've left your first love. And the other place, he says, you're allowing that Jezebel to teach. And I mean, straighten it up and get rid of it. But I'm always amazed how much he said, you're doing all this, so wonderful, you're, you're doing that, but. But the, the Philadelphia church is the only one that doesn't have a condemnation, doesn't have a rebuke, doesn't have an adjustment. 
the adjustment is, it's an open door. He said, I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. How many would like to have an open opportunity door that no devil, no man, no system could shut and hinder you from fulfilling that word? Amen. And God says, uh, let's look at chapter 3, verse 7. The church that was at the Philadelphia, that's not where the eagles are, that's, um, <coughs> that's uh, way back there. Uh, these things says he who is holy. Now, I've given this word maybe to, over the last 28, 30 years, different churches and places in the world, a few here and there, but I don't think I've ever had this word for CI. This is the first time I've ever had God give me the letter to Philadelphia for us, so I'm real happy about that. He says, he who is holy, who is true. Now, when you, when you go home or tomorrow or next day, read these two chapters. In chapter three, first, chapter one, God shows John a whole vision of himself and a whole revelation. But when he gives it to the seven churches, he only reveals a part of himself to each church. No one church is the full revelation that John saw in chapter one. And he has a different, set for same seven-point outline, but a different content for each of it. And then everything he says has relevance. How many has got personal prophecies? How many ought to go back and read them sometime and find out it's got relevance? I've had people, I give them a personal prophecy. I remember up in, uh, in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and uh, there, and I'd given them a word, and they debated on it, and they got together, and one word made a difference. They said, the prophecy said for us to stay here and not try to build. The other said, no, it said we're to stay until then and then build. So they went over and piped the word out, read it over and found out exactly what it said, word for word. That's the reason we require you type out your prophecies. Don't just leave them on tape, get them in black and white. Amen. How many have most of your prophecies typed out? How many have some not typed out? Oh, Jesus, get a hold of them, Lord, deal with them. What are you, what are you getting them for? Just for joy or fun, having a prophecy? And we don't want to be like the ones on Mars Hill that all they did is sit around here a new doctrine. How many know that? And now some people go, well, they all just own another prophecy. <laughs> Sometimes God's going to say, what did you do with the last one I gave you? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's somewhere. I got in a drawer over here. If you, God doesn't speak to you, his head rattle. Come on, if God speaks to you, he's got a purpose in it. And every word has some significance. Now notice it said here, he who is holy. Who, I've said this is the letter to us. Say, it's a letter to me. So what's he saying? I'm expecting you to be holy. He said, well, I think I ought to drink a little whiskey or beer, and I think I ought to go to a little X-rated show now and then. And I, no, no, that's not holy. I think I can lose my temper. I think I'm not forgive that person. I don't have to talk to them. No, that's not holy. God's expecting us to be holy. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all without wholeness, which no man shall be able to enter heaven without. How many want to be holy? Say, God, make me holy. Not just his holiness, but your holiness of obedience. Okay. Then it says, he who is holy and he who is true. Oh, my, my. That has two applications. One, that you're true blue. You're true to your word. You know, Christians should be the most truthful, honest, dependable people on the face of the earth. You should stay, give your word and stick with your word. Your word should be your bond. You know, in old days, they used to shake their hand, and that was sufficient, and they gave their word. Even outlaws gave their word. They, they stood for it. But today, word means nothing. God says you who are true, and, and you need to tell the truth. You say, well, I, I tell a half-truth. Half-truth is a white lie. <laughs> Amen. He wants us to be true. Then he wants us to walk in truth. Walk in present truth. Be filled with the truth. Portray the truth. And live the truth. And be true to one another. True to your mate. And true to God. So I want to be true. You can preach hours on each of these. I'm just going to highlight it. And it says he is true. He who has the key of David. And I'll cover that a little later. He who opens and no one shuts. And shuts and no one opens. I have discovered in my 62 years of ministry and 66 years of Christianity that there's someone God shuts a door 
You can pray, ball, squall, kick, scream, hit, ram your head against it, fast 40 days and nights, and it will not open. Until God opens it, you're stuck. Until God's time. Like Joseph, he said the word of the Lord tried him until his time came. But when God opens the door, oh, hallelujah. Not a demon in hell, not a man on earth, no sister can stop it from opening. Amen? And staying open. Now, as I said, 2017, we have an open door. So we have an open door. That means opportunities we never had before. And, and there's no judgment in this letter except this. If you don't go through the door. Jesus said to the, some of the Pharisees, you stand in the door. You won't go in and you, won't, you hinder others who want to go in. I don't want you just to stand in the door, go through the door. Enter and go through. So tonight when we do warfare, we're doing warfare to go through the door. Through. Through and into. Say through and into. Into God's destiny, into God's purpose, into God's plan. Now I'll be 83 next year. And I'm planning on preaching until 95 and see whether I go on or go up or go up or go on. I'm not going down. <laughs> you know. And... Uh, but I, I feel I've got work to do yet. I've got things to do. I was at a place here a while back, and uh, when I say here a while back, probably 20 years ago. <laughs> See, all relevant to the time. I said 20 years ago, Grace would say, uh, what would that be? Before I was, amen. What are you, 13, 14 now? 13, 14? How'd you get so beautiful in 14 years? I've been working 83. I had not that pretty. <laughs> amen. You know, and they said, they ask the people, how many years got prophecy that never came to pass? And some people raise their hand and say, see, prophecy doesn't work. I got up and said, how many got prophecies that have come to pass? Yes. Same people raise their hands. Same way it'd be you. How many had prophecies that have come to pass? How many have some prophecies that have never come to pass yet? Well, that's not bad news. That's good news. You've heard me say it before. The only lady that ever told me every prophecy had come to pass died in three weeks. How many glad you have prophecies that haven't come to pass yet? You might be here next year. Amen. All right. Now, I've set before you an open door. We're going to go through. Now, open, we're going to have an open heaven. Open door, open heaven, and open earth. Deuteronomy 28, 12. Now, I've encouraged you several times, several places I encouraged them. Back about 10 years ago, I encouraged everybody to memorize Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 through 12. I did it. It took me about a month to get it. It's a little complicated, but I'm memorizing. That is an open heaven. Verse 12, it says, I'll give you an open heaven. And, but it's, that's the blessings. It's blessing, blessing, blessing. In fact, according to open heaven, everything you touch will prosper. And you can't fail for succeeding. You're the head, not the tail. You're the top, not the bottom. You're always going forward, not backwards. You're more than a conqueror. Amen? That's an open heaven. But you read verse 15 through 68. Everything you do falls apart. Everything, oh, it's horrible. It's amazing. 14 verses of blessing and all these rest of these blessings of cursing. And verse 46 and 47 is really where it says, because you did not serve God with a joyful heart for the, for the abundance of all things and with a thankful heart, these curses have come upon you. Some of you need to get happy again. Thank God for what you have. Amen. Be thankful. If, you're gonna, if, you, if you want God to bless you, be thankful for what you have. How many enjoy giving to people who appreciate it and are thankful and they're really grateful? And if, if you give them to somebody here, they murmur and complain, well, I don't like what they did. Rabbi, you don't feel led to give them anymore. No wonder some of you are not getting as much. You're not thankful for what you have. Always want more, 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 more. Be thankful for what you have. Amen. I thank God. I pray to continue. I, I, I quote that scripture, I'm kept by the power of God. And I, I decree every internal organ is alive and healthy and every cell, every, everything is going to keep alive. I tell people when I was 19 years old, a phrase in my prophecy said, Yea, my son, fear thou not because of thy youth. I don't fear that anymore. <laughs> but I've had several prophecies that said, He's going to renew my youth. Now those I'm laying a hold of. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the whole key to an open heaven is repeated at the beginning and at the end. 
obeying the voice of the Lord. It says, because you've hearkened unto the voice of the Lord your God, I'm going to set you on high. Then verse 2 says, because you've obeyed the voice of the Lord, I'm going to make the blessings chase you down and overtake you. How many like all the blessings just catching up with it, chasing you down, amen? And that's, then, then you get in the curses, it says, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, all these curses come up on you. The voice of the Lord includes a Logos word, the written Bible, a rhema word, a quickened scripture, and personal prophecies. That's all the voice of the Lord. Now, how many is trying to obey the voice of the Lord? I don't know how you're obeying your prophecies, you don't even know what they said. How many has got more than 10 pages of prophecy? How about 15? How about 20, 25? Who will make it 30? <laughs> I've got 3,500 that's come over me in the last 62 years, 63 years. I haven't, I, one day I took them to the floor. I was going to Hawaii when I had all my teeth ground down and caps put on. I was 10 hours in the dentist chair one day and eight hours a day. Next day, and I got all 26 done at once. And went to Hawaii and slept for 36 hours. But anyhow, I took a, two of my three-ring notebooks to read them all, and I think I got one of them read. Uh, when I say getting back to them, you know, I'd love to sometime to go back and read all of them, but I know they're coming to pass. But it's good to go back and read it. Yeah, right. Amen? Because what you, what you grabbed hold of then is not relevant. When, when, what wasn't relevant to you now, then is now. How many have gone back and read prophecies you got two or three years ago? And found, wow, I didn't know God said that. Wow, I didn't know that was true. All right, let's do it. Amen. Now, now we have an open earth. The scripture said, earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord. And God said, I'll open earth to you. Now, I, I, I don't worry about your political standing, but in USA, we've been given a legal, natural opportunity to rise and shine as a church. We've got a defender for the church coming in. He says he's going to repeal the Johnson uh, the old that stops ministers from trying to speak uh, from the pulpit for key issues. And um, I believe we got an open earth, open heaven, and open door. Now, we can't sit back and say, okay, president, do it, Congress, do it. No, no. It's a time for the church to advance. The reason things went the way they did is because the church prayed. 81% of evangelicals participated. The church prayed. We prayed. We did warfare. And I did it in California and Texas here for God's will to be done in this, in this election. And we had a word to be divine reversals and suddenly, suddenness. And suddenly there was a reversal and things happened. And we have to accept it and move into it and let God work miracles. Amen? And miracles are going to be worked. Now, he said, I'll give you the key of David. And they won't have time to deal a lot with this, but the key of David is three, it has, that key has three notches on it. The spirit of revelation, worship, and warfare. There's three notches on it. And you got to have, if you're going to use that key, you got to have all three notches on it. Worship, David, David was a worshiper. Now David, you studied David, he didn't have many visions, dreams, angelic visitations, or out-of-body experiences, but he had more revelation than any other. Read the Psalms of David in the book of Psalms. Man, he had revelation of creation. He had revelation of God's doings. I mean, so, so much. If you haven't read the book of Psalms, go back and read it. And think, look, oh, my, David understood all that. He got that revelation and that revelation. There's so much there that God got. You know, I was always, always been a little discouraged because I didn't get out-of-body experiences and heavenly visions and dreams and all the like seem like everybody else. I've had two or three major dreams and two or three major visions in my 62 years. Some, uh, uh, one, one prophet says he has two or three a night. I thought, good. I, one lady says she goes to heaven every day and comes back. I said, great, good, good for you. I have to walk by faith. <laughs> but you know, God said, look, didn't I tell you your, day, your life would go like David's? I said, yes. Well, look at David's life. He lived by revelation. Come on. And, and, he, and Paul says, by revelation, God made known to me. So I, did, I realized my main anointing is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. 
My first prophecy came over in Bible because I said, your wisdom will come forth as the voice of the Lord your God. And God said, I'll give you revelation. I'll show you things that no man's ever taught or preached before. And we have preached and taught truths and revelations and moves of God that nobody else has saw. I've seen or dealt with. That so worship. Worship is to God is, was, was David's passion. You know, you don't, know, you don't hear anything about worship and praise until David comes along. Come on. You read, you read your Bible. For the first 2,500 years, you don't have anybody worshiping or praising or anything much about it. But when David comes along in the Psalms, you have all the information about worship and praise. Except Moses set up the choirs and uh, those. And, uh, Dean wrote a book. You can get that and find out all the good news on it. And I know that uh, some were talking about the Tabernacle of David's been revived, but I think it's more going to be what Dean has written about the Tabernacle of God's coming forth, amen, with the Third Reformation. Then it says, <clears throat> so, you know, David had a revelation of Psalm 22.3. How many know what Psalm 22.3 says? How many worship? Why do you worship? Well, you love God, yeah, but you expect something, don't you? What you expect when you worship? The presence of God, right? 22.3 says God inhabits the praises of his people. I said under the apostle who got that revelation in 19, uh, he got it in 1952, 53. He got the revelation that God inhabits the praise of his people. He was an Englishman, and he'd go around for it. Hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Dead, formal, but he believed, he praised God, he God would inhabit his praises. I mean, it was picked up in the latter rain movement and the charismatic movement. Now everybody quotes it. God inhabits the praises, enthroned in the praises of his people. David was a worshiper, but David was also a warrior. David is the only, David and Joshua are the two greatest generals, warriors in the Bible. The, the two greatest fighters, warriors in the Bible. Joshua conquered Canaan, and David expanded Israel to the Abrahamic promises. Joshua didn't. Joseph, sons of Joseph, didn't. None of the judges did. But David came. Saul didn't. He expanded them, the word they prophesied in Genesis 15, 18. He said, it'll be all the way over the Euphrates River, all the way up the Euphrates River, uh, up across the borders of Turkey, back down the Mediterranean Sea, across that little city of, a uh, little stream of, uh, called the uh, River of Egypt, across over to the point there. And, and no one ever did that but David. David took it all the way. And I tell you, this is the year of Davidic anointing coming upon us to expand and fulfill personal prophecies. How many like to fulfill your personal prophecies like never before? How many, have, how many have some that you think it's time to be fulfilled? It's time. It's time. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I, I like to say this. God's raising up a Joshua generation with the key of David to fulfill all of God's prophetic promises to Israel and his beloved church. And... Um, I'll, I'll say that later. Also, war angels. David learned how to cooperate with, God, with Michael and his war angels. You're going to have to learn how to work with your angel and God's war angels. And I, I work with God's war angels all over the country. As I've led nations in war, and I've led churches in war, and I always call on Michael and his war angels. He promised me in July of back there that he would be with me. And so the war angels. You remember David was getting ready to go against the Philistines? He said, God, how do I do it? He says, well, go out here by these trees and wait there because the Philistines are just over that hill. And you wait there. <clears throat> and when you hear the marching and sound of chariots and horses and clanging of things, and you see these trees start leaning toward the battle, <clears throat> you and your soldiers take off immediately and start fighting Philistines and Michael and his war angels will kill the and fight the principalities and powers that are empowering these Philistines. And you kill the physical Philistines, they'll wipe out the spirit forces. When we go to war here, the angels fight in the heavens. So they, I, people are seeing vision of it. Uh, they, and I've done, this in, uh, I've done this in Africa and Asia and Europe and Australia and New Zealand and England and, and uh, even in Canada, hallelujah. And, and, and I'm amazed. Uh, they still go to war because God has warriors. God's looking for warriors. I said, God's looking for warriors. Amen. I was preaching over in Korea about 20 years ago, and I was talking about 
God hates wimps. You know, that's these deadbeat, spineless, boneless, chicken livered, good for nothing, lazy, visionless, blah, Christians. Lukewarm, indifferent, no vision. Yeah. Come to church, yeah. Just a bump on a log. Body on a chair. No zeal, no love, no, no response. They're wimpy. And they had a word for it in Korean. And I, and I, got, I was excited, and I got preaching. I said, God hates wimps. I thought, wow. I just say that? Do I have a scripture for that? How many know you should have a scripture for what you say? And I thought a minute and said, yeah, I do have a scripture for that. God sold to the Laodicean church. I would that you're hot or cold, but because you're wimpy, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Amen? God hates wimpy people. Dead beats, no vision, no zeal, no, no, just, not good for the devil or God or anybody. He's just worthless. Pucalanimous, yeah, you just got to puke them out. <laughs> Hallelujah. My, 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 my. Psalm 103, verse 20 through 21 says, God declares angels excel in strength, and they heed the voice of the Lord, and those saints who speak for their commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ. David is the only man that the Bible declares was a man after God's own heart. We can be both God-loving worshipers and bold and fearless warriors. You don't have to be sweet-loving of warriors. You can be both. I said you can be both. We're lovers of God and warriors. David was a lover of God, a worshiper, and a warrior. Amen. Then he said, verse 8, You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Say it with me. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. That reveals that we have not forsaken our calling and our destiny. We've not denied his name, apostle and prophet, like many have. We have maintained the name apostle and prophet. Now we're maintaining the word mighty warrior and Lord of hosts. How many know that many rejected that there's not apostles and prophets in the church today? But there's, a, there's 365 names of God in the Bible. Five of them is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Come on. He is the five. These five are an extension of Christ himself to the church. So if you deny Apostle Prophet, you're denying part of his name. And we haven't denied his name. Now we have to accept him as a mighty warrior and a Lord of hosts. Now, I'm trying to go through this real fast. I know we got more time. We got money because we just took the offering. All right. Now, verse 9. God said, and this is a strange verse. Have you ever read this verse? It's, for, look at it. it's a very strange verse. He says, verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are charismatics. They're strong Christians, but they're not. But he indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. You know what that's telling me? Like we've heard prophesied over and over again, God's getting ready to separate the goats and the sheep. God's going to show who the real sheep are and who the goats are. God's going to show who the real move of God, loving God, following God people are and who the rebels are. So get ready for a separation and a definition of who you are. Amen. We had our international prophets gathering four or five years ago. God said he's going to make a broader line of demarcation between the, those that's what we call the righteous seed and the wicked seed. And then it says, he said, verse uh, 10, this verse will said, be made reality before the end of 2018. Notice what he says. He says, he's going to keep us from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I heard the Lord say, before 2018 is through, we will face threats of World War III nuclear war. 
There's going to be some things happen, some things take place that the whole world is going to be right on edge. And you're going to hear a lot of talk about nuclear war, and, and, and it's going to shake up people like it's never been shaken before. Did you know during the Kennedy administration and Cuba situation, we came within 15 minutes of nuclear war? Have you ever seen the movies they've shown on that and the, and the documentaries? And, and they came that close to pushing the button and rockets start firing back and forth. And it's going to come in. But you know, God says everything that can be shaken will be shaken, and the only thing that cannot be shaken is the kingdom of God. How many want your kingdom of God established in you? We've got to get it. Now, I want you to memorize 8.18, Romans 8.18. Paul says, the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, when Apostle Paul says the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared, he's talking about things that make your problems look like Aunt Jemima's pancakes floating. Amen. He was beaten with 39 stripes five times. Jesus was beaten once. He was beaten, that's 194 stripes up and down his back. Can you imagine what his, in the back of his head to his toe? He'll, nah, I was watching The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson, was it, the other night. How they, I mean, that wasn't over portrayed. That's probably the way they did it. 39 stripes. Then he was beaten with rods five times. And, now, and those rods hurt. I remember when my dad, you know, I, I, I realized now I was an eye personality, and I couldn't keep my mouth shut. My dad was German background. You do what I say and don't think about it. Just do it. Oh, I'm not that type. Why? You know. And he'd tell me to do something, and I'd, why? I didn't say, why? Mom. He'd grab a check line or a board, but those boards, man, they are stung. And I thought, wham, wham. I remember one time, uh, before I got saved, <laughs> we'd done something, I, and I'd, 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 I'd take it up cussing, and, and I, was, I had to be about 15, I guess. And um, he told me to do something, and I said, why? And, and I said, I just want to do it. Tell me why. He grabbed me by the wrist and grabbed the board. And he started beating. And he'd beat me and I'd cuss him. He'd, okay. he'd beat and I'd cuss. And he, he black and blued me from the base of my neck to my heels. Probably whipped me 20, 30 times. I mean, straps. And finally he just got tired and, and, and let me go. And he said, heard me cussing around the corner. And I remember going around the corner of the house. And I, could, I just see him in the desert, kick dirt in his face. <laughs> you know. Don't give up on your stubborn, bullheaded kids. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I just, I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't give in. You know, and uh, that helped in the positive, what's bad in the negative. Amen. All right. How many's ever been stubborn, bullheaded? You know, just yeah, never ever. <laughs> just raise some kids that way, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Married a man. <laughs> All right. Now, <clears throat> you know, I probably got a whipping average of once a week from the time I was two years old till I was 15. I probably needed three. <laughs> but I wouldn't have needed as many if my dad would just talk to me. But he wouldn't talk. he just do no, no reason, no logic, you know, and I just, so I just had to, well, thank God I got what I got. No telling what I'd be if I'd been left to myself. And man, I'd be in jail. It'd be like when a bus driver kicked me off the school bus and he kicked me off, he said, that boy would be a murderer or a preacher. <laughs> I'm glad I turned out to be a preacher. <laughs> I'm going to be a devil destroyer, amen? Hallelujah. Now look what he said. Verse 12, if we overcome, say overcome. Other translations say conqueror. Jesus will make us a permanent fixture, pillar, in the temple of his God, Jesus will write us on us his name of his God and the new name. That means he will not allow us to miss out on any new thing that he shall do with his church on the earth and in heaven. How many want to be a part of every new thing God does on the earth? We've been, I've been keeping you informed. We're part of the prophetic apostolic movement. We're part of the, we've participated in the saints movement. We're now in the uh, prophetic, I mean, in the third and final church reformation, and we're moving on in God. And we must, and then he closes every letter ends with this. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. 
Now this is his letter to us. Open door that no man can shut. And the only condemnation will be if you don't go through. So tonight, I'm going to take you in warfare, and we're going to start off the year going through. Amen. Not just standing and looking at it like a calf looking at a gate. Amen. We're going to go through. Now, let me advance one last word, advancement. How many wants to advance? I mean, I, uh, I just, if you want me to die, just threaten me someplace I can't advance. Can't have any sense of accomplishment. You know, just being home, what little I'm home, I have to readjust to something I've got to accomplish. Uh, you know, <clears throat> people say, you've got to rest. I say, I have to labor to enter into rest. <laughs> Hebrew says, labor to enter into rest. Some people it becomes natural. I have to labor at it. Amen. All right. Some of you understand, others don't. Okay. Now, let me tell you this. The first reformation of the church was 300 to 400 AD. Church birth established worldwide. Second Reformation was the Reformation of the Church, eight major reformations, 1517 to 2007. And 2008, what year is this? Two, not yet, 2016. All right, we'll soon be 17. And we're in the third and final church reformation. It started 2008, but in 2016, he decreed the birthing and activating of God's World War III. We are now in God's World War III. And then in, in the restoration movements compared to the children of Israel's journey from Egypt to Canaan, 1517 Protestant movement shows the blood applied and, and Israel coming out of Egypt. The 1600s evangelical movements crossed to the Red Sea and water baptism. 1700 Holdings movement is when they came to the banks of the Red Sea and separated from Israel, I mean from Egypt. 1800 faith healing movement the waters of Mera, everybody was to think about it. Three million people healed in one day. They all drank of that water and every healing. And they said there wasn't a sick one among them during the 40 years, except when they sinned and judgment came. And they said their shoes didn't wear out and their dresses didn't wear out. Wore the same dress for 40 years. Wouldn't you love that, ladies? <clears throat> same suit. <laughs> and they had the same food every day. Manna. Angel food. They cooked it, they boiled it, they flapjacked it, they tacoed it, they did everything. But it was still manna. Still manna, amen. 1900, we had the Pentecostal movement, water from the rock with the spirit language. 1950s, the charismatic movement, they come to Mount Sinai, the body of Christ, membership, all of that. 1988, the prophetic apostolic movement, crossed the church, they crossed over Jordan, crossed the church over Jordan, the prophetic apostolic movement. 2007, we had the saints movement, and then 2008, we had the third and final church reformation decreed. Did you know you're the very few people that know that's going on? Do you know there's Catholics don't even know there's anything different than Protestants out there? I met a Lutheran lady up, uh, it was just in uh, Saginaw, Michigan, and was at the hotel there. And she said, I was reading a book, she said, a certain book, and I said, no, it's this book. And she's a Lutheran. I could tell her, she didn't know there's anybody else in the world who kept Lutherans, you know. And, and that's, that was the beginning. That was one of the first churches of the Protestant movement in 1517 area. And they know there's Baptists, don't know there's anything else. There's Pentecostals, don't know there's anything else. And there's Charismatics, faith people, don't know. God's on the move. The church is not a pond, it's not a lake, it's a river flowing. And it gets ankle deep, knee deep, loin deep, and it gets waters to swim in, and it goes into a great ocean. Amen? Amen? We're on the move. Now, the only problem is, what you going to do about it? Now, we're in the first phase of the resurrection of the dead, doctrine, resurrection life. Say resurrection life. How many wants a resurrection life? That's the first phase. 2016 is activation of the army of the Lord into offensive warfare. And then 2020 will be the first phase of the eternal judgment doctrine of Psalm 149, 5 through 9. But 2017 is open doors with the opportunities for promotion and possessing. Amen. Amen. Open door. You're going to get business deals that you couldn't get before. You're going to get contracts signed that you've worked for months and years and it won't work. You're going to get ideas to put things together. Things are going to work that didn't work before. Don't, don't think it's the rest of the day. Go back and check it out. This is a new day. I said, this is a new day. 2017. Till the kingdom... I've established as a full minister, we're in God's World War III, 
It's warfare with, warfare with prophetic acts of faith. Everybody say acts of faith. Acts. Prophetic acts of faith. You heard me teach on that. With God's weapons of mass destruction to powers of darkness and Satan's army of wicked spirits. The shout of faith is the church's WMD. I said the shout of faith is the church's WMD. You know what the WMD is? Oh, you old timers do. You know the bushes, the weapons of mass destruction. Our shout of faith goes off in the heaven of them as powerful if you blew up an atomic bomb in the natural. How many of you ever seen the movies where they shut off an atomic bomb in the science, you know? And I mean, boo, 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 or these big old, what was that, uh, 70, where the big old 15 mile well, came over and, vroom, brrr, and you just sit continuing out. Well, that's the way when we shout, it just brrr, blows demons every direction. Hallelujah. It works. Hundreds of people have seen visions and seen things and heard things and knew them. Now, this is, this is my final, final point. Decree and shout it to be. Decree and shout it to be. And I've had just a little note here. I, God gave me a dream the other night. I don't get very many spiritual dreams, but I was going over believer. Work it out, deal with it. He said, if I can just get them to become believers, we can get the job done. And as a believer, believer, what, what could happen if you're really a believer? If, I, if you can believe, what's possible? Huh? What did he say? Anything, everything, all things are possible. Believe. Now, there's a, we were singing, I believe, I believe, I believe in him. But what God challenged me a few years back is the five steps to producing anything for God. Whatsoever you desire, that's King James, Mark eleven twenty four. Whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive, and you shall have. If we'd had time, I'd have had... Dean starts singing, I receive, I receive, I receive, I have a miracle, I have a miracle, I have a miracle. And God told me, I was flying back on a plane, I said, God, why aren't we seeing this happen and that happen? He says, you got the three, but you're leaving out the two. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, what? But that's only third step, what's five and six? Receive, and you'll have. But to have it, you got to believe you've received it. To receive it, you got to believe it. To believe it, you got to ask God for it. To ask God for it, you got to have a desire. It's like, what's your name here? What's your name here? What? Andrew? Anthony. 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 It's like an angel comes down. Woof! Anthony. Next three seconds, tell me your three greatest desires, you'll have them. And you say, um, 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 three us. Bless you, brother. If God came to you right now and said, give me your three greatest desires and you could have them, if you have to stop and think about it, you don't have them. It's like when my wife used to ask me, honey, do you love me? I better not stop and start thinking about it. Because it's suddenly outer space flying saucers, you know. What would you think if you asked that man, do you love me? Let me think about it. Let me see what, you know. It made power right in the antenna. <laughs> Redhead come alive. <laughs> believe. We don't understand believe. I'm going to work on that word. It's, I'm going to work on that until we, we got it. But it's, it's not acknowledge. For instance, Gracie, do you believe George Washington was the first president? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? She don't know how to talk, but she can nod her head. <laughs> Now, what's the difference? I believe George Washington, first president. You believe the record, right? I believe Jesus, son of God. You believe the record, but that don't save you. Come on. Acknowledging facts or truth doesn't put truth in you. He that receives the son and has the son, he that hath the son hath everlasting life. See, when you say, I believe, you're believing with your head. Are you with me? You're acknowledging Jesus is the Son of God, but that won't save you. You've got to believe means to incorporate 
to become, to be, to become, to receive, to trust, to have confidence, accept, receive. Come on. Believe. Believe. You got to believe you believe. You don't really believe what you believe. In other words, acknowledge means to assent to it being truth or to admit you believe it to be true by mentally accepting it as a fact. The third Reformation. I wrote the book. I've taught it, but most of you still don't believe it. You accept it. You believe what I said is the truth because you believe me. You know I tell the truth. But you haven't, got, it, it hasn't, you haven't gone through the door. Are you with me? I wrote the book on 70 reasons, speaking in tongues. I got in here, I was, I was looking up these eight reasons. You got to take action. See, let me tell you, I, I learned one of the big lessons. The reason, how many's got something you're trying to believe God for right now? How many's got a prayer before God? How many are praying because you should pray or you're praying expecting answers and things to happen? See, quit saying I believe and add the other, I receive, I have. Now, let me, let me help us here because we're getting ready to go to war. Now, the four principles of activation is believe and know it's the truth. How many, how many know the prayer you're praying right now, is it biblical? <clears throat> you're not going to have to do lie or cheat or do something wrong. How many believe what you're praying for is according to the will of God? It's according to the word, according to the will. And you believe the way it'll work out. So if it's God's will, and it's your will, how come nothing's being done? Do you believe it's God's will? Believe it's God's will to heal you, prosper you, straighten out the family? Come on. If you, but you have you received it? Do you have it? So you can believe forever and have nothing. Come on. Believing is only step number three. And the other is, the four steps of activating or answered prayer, besides the five, is believe, know it's biblical. Believe it's know the word. Second, believe in your heart. Romans 10 says, with the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confessions made to possess him. See, with the heart, you believe. Your head is not a believer. Your head was never designed to believe. Your head is a gather of facts, information. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing the word of God. It comes. It didn't say faith is hearing. You can hear all day. Faith he comes. And the way God, when I faith movement came along, I tried to get in on it, and I just couldn't. Understand. And I stood in one day, God says, faith comes. Faith comes. Oh, you read the word, you quote the word, you hear the word, you preach the word, and you send it to the heart. And soon faith comes. You put all the right ingredients and the baked, cake is baked. They didn't get that over here. Your head gathers scriptures, testimonies, preaching, whatever, faith, praying tongues, blows up, and you send it to the heart. And when the right combination's there, Faith comes. How many has ever had when you knew faith came? How many has ever had just faith came? You, you, had, you believed, you, you knew it, you had it. See, when you know you've got it, you've got it. Some of you girls think you're going to be on maids, never get married. But when you got it, you've got confidence. Don't chase the boys. You, I'm available when God's time. Right? Is that good advice, girls? Daddy says yes. Okay. Now. Number three is speak with the mouth. Number four is take action. Now, there's no such thing as believing without action. Believe, let's use believing in faith for synonymous here. In James chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 14 through 26, eight different times it says faith without works is dead. Let me read them to you. Verse 14, faith without works does not profit. Verse 17, faith by itself without works is dead. Verse 18, I demonstrate my faith by my works. Verse 20, 
do you, not, do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 21, the faith of Abraham was working together with his works, action, and by works his faith was made perfect. There's no biblical faith without action. A man is justified by works, action, and not by faith only. And verse 26, the one we all quote, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Some lady came up to me one day and said, I got all the, I've got a house full of faith. I said, y'all dead. You have no action. There's no such thing as biblical faith. Without, you can say, I believe, I believe, I believe. And you can think it in your head, but you've got to take heart, act, faith, and then action. And mouth is part of action. Let me give you an example. Was your Anthony? Was it? Oh, I'll get your name now. If I remember your name, it'd be a miracle for something. <laughs> Let's say Anthony comes to me and says, Bishop, I got about $5,000. I want to enroll in this big education program or something. I need $5,000 by January or something, you know. And I said, well, let's believe God. So we pray and agree and agree in Jesus' name. We'll two or three agree together. And we just pray in Jesus' name. I say, Anthony, you believe? I believe. Amen. I see him three weeks later. You got that $5,000 yet, Anthony? No. What are you going to do if you don't get it? Oh, it's down the drain. Everything's going to work out. I'm not going to be able to do anything. Does he believe? What would he be saying if he believed? I've got it. Smiles on his face. I'm just waiting to see how God's going to get it to me. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's, it's, it's done. I've got it. How many of you ever checked the oil in your oil, car? And how many like to have a dipstick to ch- check how much faith you got? How many know God doesn't answer prayer? God answers faith expressed in prayer. They didn't get that over here. I'm sorry. I had to say the first word to get your attention. God answers faith expressed in prayer. Whatsoever you desire when you, that's just step number two. Believe, you receive, you have it. So you believe you received it. Do you have it? And you should get as excited before you get it. See, when a person has really had faith, and it happens, but, oh, aren't you excited? Well, I've been knowing all along. I mean, they had it all along. See? Faith, joy, peace. Faith is a dipstick. How much faith do you have? See, Jane knew she had Tom all along, but when she, he realized it, man, he got so happy. But she knew it all along. See? <laughs> she had him. <laughs> Amen? Now, if you want to know how much you're going to, how much possibility of you getting what you're praying for, check your dipstick, how much faith do you have? Excellent. It's not by your praying, it's by your faith in your praying. Come on. You can pray till dawn comes, and God may have pity on some of us and just do it in spite of us. But if you're really going to get something done, you've got to have faith. It, it bugs God when we don't believe him. Psalm 78, it says, they said, can God? God did this, God did that, God put water from the rock, God fed them meat, God did this. Then they said, can God do this? And the Bible says, God heard it and was furious. Angels looked and said, how come people don't believe you, God? I don't know. I was with my disciples, and a storm came up, and they started screaming, help, help. I get up and say, where's your faith? I just fed 5,000. Can't you believe me for a little wind and rain? Oh, God, help us. God rebuked a lot of people. Most of them were his disciples. Why don't you believe? And I'm determined to become a full believer. How many want to become a full believer? And the way we're going to take action, we're going to go to war. And I don't have time to preach on prophetic acts. Uh, I'll have my book back in about three weeks. This is one I autographed to Pastor Tom and Jane. But World War III, we're in it. And God's given us prophetic acts. Prophetic acts, there's about 15 or 20 in the Bible, prophetic. Come on, Dean, get your musicians and drummers, all get ready. I'm going to take my coat off. We're going to, 
I said, well, if I can do this, it's hot in here. We're going to get sweaty in hell. And uh, don't, don't let that $1,000 fall out. <clears throat> now, I, I, in there, I, I give you all these weapons of warfare. And the shout is the greatest one given in the Bible. The shout in the walls of Jericho fell. When Jesus comes back, he comes back with a shout. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. shout. When he comes back, he says, Hallelujah. And when he hits that yah, the dead are raised. And you're changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye. And thank God you're going to look better than you do now. Amen. This big old belly will be traded for slender and there. I'll get waves back on my beach. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. How many believe it's going to be the fastest makeover you ever saw in your life? What they do on TV is nothing but when the RT takes place, the rapture. Amen. We're going to be changed in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye, and they say there's 25 twinkles in a blink. That's a microsecond, right? How many believe it? How many believe it's not a fairy tale? How many believe in the RT, resurrection and translation? Change in the moment. That's how powerful the shout is. Psalm 47, 5 says, God's going up with a shout. Moses, when he started leading the children forth, the clouds started moving, the fire started moving. He said, he rose and he shouted, let God arise and his enemies be scattered and all who hate him be destroyed. There's power in a shout. You say, well, I feel, I remember Ron Rayon told me, about the third meeting is in that we led the shout. He said, when I first did this, I felt silly. I said, all spiritual things make the flesh feel silly. How many felt silly when you talk in tongues sometimes? Hell, anything, the, the flesh does not understand the spirit. And God chose the foolish things to confound the wise. And God chose the things that embarrass the flesh so you could be crucified. Amen. There's power in the shout. Now, what I want to do, and then you have to take action. So what I have people do, I've done this in 30 nations around. Instead of waving your hands or clapping your hands, because action portrays, you know, it then went over to Missy and said, I love you. <laughs> How many know actions speak louder than words? <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> you know, you see, you know, if, if, if I do this, what am I saying? You know, if I do this, I worship. If I do this, you know. I mean, so when we do this, it's clap. When we raise, it's worship. I need, I praise, I surrender. But when we do this, it's warfare. You're acting out warfare. And when little, when little Treya did that last year, she started warfaring. It broke off the demonic oppression. It broke things there. And she... she she said, was I born again then? I said, no, you've already been born again, but you became a new creation. How many like to just be a new you? How many like, like they said at the beginning, we're not going to take into 2017 anything that's negative in 2016. We're going to go through, through the door, through the door, through the door. Amen. Stand up. Hallelujah. Now, I need some helpers up here. Um, I, need some, I need some young people. Where'd Trey go? Trey, come on, you gotta help me. Come on, Gracie, you gotta help me. I want some, uh, you can, I want some of these youngins up here to help me. As more as any other uh, junior, these young ones too, come on up. They're, they're warriors. They'll fight. Come on up. You can help me stand my bishop up here. I want all these row of teenagers back here. Come on up and help me. Come on up here, help me. If this old 82 old great grandpa can do it, you're gonna come on up here on the platform. Be bold, be strong. Don't now I want the up ministers here. up here and the young people. All right. the young and youngers. Hallelujah. Now, listen. All right, if you're CI ministry. The way we do up. this, every time I do this, I'm I'm knocking a demon out. I'm I'm knocking a, a financial problem out. I'm knocking a social problem out. And boom, boom. And and, and you know, and let me tell you, do it do it with enthusiasm. I'll give you one illustration. Help, there's about three of you need help over here. A king, a king went to, I mean, went to Elisha, and Elisha was very sick on his deathbed. 
And the king of Israel came to Elisha and said, I need another prophecy. Like some of you come on Friday night. I just got to have another prophecy. What you youngins doing down there? Come on. We, 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 can get, we can have romantic, pe- romantic people up here. I know you're lovers, but you're fighters too. Come on. Come on, here's some more. If you can fight for football, you can fight for the Lord. Amen. Come on, all right. Now, hallelujah. Good warriors, huh? Yeah. All right. Now, let me, let me help some of you. Now, these eight-year-olds and 82-year-olds are going to do it. All you others, do the best you can. I know you, but we don't have any wimps here. We're all warriors. Amen. In fact, uh, I need a whole lot up here in front and, and facing the audience. About 30, 40, 50, come up. Warriors, I want to come up front. Come on. Not on platform, up front. Turn around and face the audience. All right. Come on. Come on, make a line across here. Come on, make a line across here. Make a line across here. Come on. Anybody else wants to come down? Come on down if you feel like it. All right. If you feel young and a warrior. Now, let me tell you about this incident. Here, let me show you how important. Spread out so that you don't hit each other. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't get close to you. Go. We're going to boom, boom, boom. All right. Let me tell you. Um, your enthusiasm will determine your victory. Uh-oh. Let me tell you about this story. You can go home and read it in 2 Kings. This, this king came to Elisha, the prophet, and said, the Syrians are coming against me. I hear reports, they're coming. He says, what do I do? He said, I need a miracle working prophecy. How many of you ever felt like you need a miracle working prophecy to overcome my enemy? So the, Elisha said, okay, um, come up here, I need you a moment to dramatize this. And he said, take your arrow out of your quiver, take your bow, put it in there, draw it back. And he had to open the window over here first. We got it open, okay. And he said, shoot it. Shoom. And it goes through the window. And he said, you'll get the victory over the Syrians because of the area you through the window. Then he said, then he backed off from the king and left him on his own initiative. Then he said, take your arrows and beat them on the ground. And the king took his arrows and he was a sweet, charismatic Santa Claus, Jesus Christian. You didn't get that, did you? I said, he was a sweet, charismatic Santa Claus, Jesus Christian. My, my, my. And he says, bang, bang, bang. And the Bible says, Elisha arose in holy anger and said, why didn't you beat those until there were toothpicks and splinters? But because you didn't do it with enthusiasm, I had a red-hot prophecy ready to prophesy your enemy would come and you'd destroy them as you destroyed those arrows. But because you didn't do it with enthusiasm, I got to change my prophecy. Now I got to tell you, you're going to get the one victory through that window, but then they're going to come in and wipe you out. How many want to wipe out your enemy and not your enemy wipe you out? So what we do, do with enthusiasm. Go down and show them how to do it now. All right. Now that man knows how to do it. Now, <clears throat> we're going to shout, and then you got a song for us, Dino? Yes. A warfare song. And then we're going to, we're going to do warfare for about 15 minutes. And... Um, yeah, well, I told him I'd be through by 11. I'm doing pretty good. Amazing. Amazing. All right. All right. Um, if you're colored in with somebody, get your coats off and get your Bibles out of your hand and get free and ready to go. Amen. We're warriors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, I decree that the warfare we're doing is to drive out every demonic restriction every confusing, every belittling yes. thing that would de- de- detect us or deter us, that we're going to go through the door, open door that God's given us, yes. all the way to our destiny, uh, and possess our promised possession. Yes. In 2017, we're not going to look at the door, we're not just going to pray about the door, we're not going to stand in the door, we're going through the door into God's abundance, and we're going to leave behind every hindrance, every yes. restriction, and become a new creation. Amen? Advance. That's our decree. So shall it be, and we shall warfare for it. Now let's shout, that as we shout, he'll start transitioning us into the warfare. Amen? All right, ready? I'm going to say, Lord Jesus, when I say Christ, I want you ready? I want all you got, all you got, all the volume you got, everything you have. Amen? Are you ready? Lord Jesus
the gate, through the door. Every opposition, victory over the enemy. Fight with angel armies, fight with execution. 
nation on, fight on, and on, have no mercy fight Fire. and tear the kingdoms of darkness down so I fight with God Almighty, fight with revelation, fight with oh, angel yeah, yeah, army, yeah, 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 fight yeah. with on, expectation, on, on, on. fight and have come no on, mercy, on. fight and tear the kingdom of darkness down. So I fight, 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 oh, yeah, fight. Come on, come on, come on, fight. come on, come on, come on, fight. Yeah.
Hallelujah. Well, give somebody a high five and say, I am a warrior. How about you? Can we give Bishop Hammond a big hand of love, just appreciation for the gift of God, a general in the body of Christ, the army of the Lord? Amen. Well, you may be seated in the house of the Lord, if you can, for a few more moments. Wow, you know, my wife gave me gave that word about comeback. I was thinking the greatest comeback that ever happened in history was when Jesus was beaten. He was mocked. He was taken down by the government and by all the religious forces of the day that were negative. And the demons rejoiced one day, two strikes. And said, three strikes, you're out. They didn't know. It was out of the grave and rising victorious over death, hell, and the grave for all mankind. The greatest victory, the greatest comeback that ever happened was Jesus when he arose again after he paid the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. And so we're going to partake of communion. And as we do what we're going to do, I'm going to invite the, the ushers to come. They're going to serve you. And as we partake together, what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate the victory that the Lord won for you and I. That we are going through the gate, we're going through the open door, we're going into the promises and the blessings and all that Jesus paid the price for, for our lives. I feel like we might need to do this differently than we, how we normally do it. I, our ushers and our deacons love us. <laughs> <laughs> They're flexible. What we're going to do is we're going to have you just stand here, and we're going to have you guys file by to receive the communion. And as you're walking past, you are stepping through an open door. Amen. We're going to do this as a prophetic act. And so, um, so we're going to have different ones that are standing up here to, with the communion elements. But as you file past, we're going to line up over here, and we're just going to Um, they can pick it up as they go by. They can just pick it up as they go by, okay? Sorry, we're just flying by the seat of our pants right now. <laughs> we're doing a prophetic act, okay? Yeah. And what we're going to do is as we're taking the communion, we're going to be signifying as we walk from this side to this side, and you're going to come from over here, okay? You're going to come from over here. You're going to be stepping through an open door, all right? As a matter of fact, is there any way, is there any any um, banner or something that that can, all right, let's get a banner that they can kind of walk under or something, okay? I just, I feel like you guys need to really get this in your heart and in your spirit, that we're not just walking out of one year into the next. We're walking through a spiritual open door full of opportunity and advancement for our future. And I feel like if you can see it, as you receive the communion, this prophetic act will solidify this in you, that you're not going to be going out of here the same way that you came in, okay? And so if you guys want to stand up, um, we're going to just take the elements and then let's walk through the door, go back to your seats, and we're going to all partake together, okay? We're going to all partake together. And so um, you guys could just... Yeah, actually, Sally, where are you, Sally? Could you get your, your jubilee trump your jubilee trumpet, your shofar? And we're gonna come up here and we're gonna just we're gonna just um, signify this time of coming through the open door. But we're gonna start it out with the blast of the shofar. The blast of the shofar was always a mobilizing sound to the people of God. So she's going to blast the trumpet. She's going to blast the sound of the shofar, signifying the coming into the new year. And then we're going to give one more big shout. And then we're going to worship the Lord as we come and take our communion together. All right? shout hallelujah teruah 
are being said to you. Father, we just meditate on your goodness. We meditate on the victory that you paid the price for on the cross of Calvary. We just allow our mind to be stayed upon you that our hearts will be kept in perfect peace. We allow the victory that you paid the price for to be a part of who we are and how your burden is light. You are the bread of life. You are Jehovah Jireh. My Let's hold up the cup. Lord, we know that the cup represents your blood, which purchased for us a new covenant, Lord, that through your blood, our sins can be completely removed, completely washed away, not just covered by the blood, but completely removed and thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Lord, tonight as we partake, Lord, we break every yoke of shame, every yoke of discouragement, every yoke of confusion, every yoke of disappointment, Lord. Father, we break every yoke of infirmity, Lord, that has tried to rob our health from our bodies, from our minds. We break every yoke of poverty that has tried to rob from us, from our finances and from our families. We break every yoke of division that has been assigned against marriages and families. And Lord, we thank you, Father God, that the yoke is destroyed because of your anointing. The yoke is destroyed because of what you purchased for us on Calvary, Lord, by the shedding of your blood. We receive the breakthrough tonight to break in to 2017 with victory, with the spirit of triumph, and with overcoming, Lord. Looking forward, Father, to seeing every setback give way to comebacks, Father, and to see comebacks become victories. In Jesus' name, let's partake of the cup together. And let's give the Lord a big shout of victory and a shout of celebration. Hallelujah! Praise God. We're going to celebrate Happy New Year in just a little bit. But how many know we're already celebrating Happy New Life? Amen. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we're going to dismiss you from the sanctuary and, and just invite you to come back to uh, the multi-purpose room, the gym. And go out the side for you and just down the hallway and then to the left you'll see the opening into the uh, room with all the tables. Let's uh, go. There's some food and fellowship. We're going to